this is about the TikTok crisis. You know, I, I agree, generally speaking, with both the White House and the, and the Republicans and Democrats in the House of Representatives who, on a bipartisan basis, overwhelming vote. Uh, I think there were only 83 no votes, uh, you know, out of, out of uh, close to 500, um, 400 and whatever it is, um, voted to say if TikTok wants to continue to be on your phone here in the United States, it has to be owned by a company that by law doesn't have to share information with the Chinese government. And that's all well and good. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm actually supportive of that legislation, although I'm very skeptical that it'll make it through the Senate, and even if it does, um, you know, it, it doesn't force a, 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 a release of TikTok until uh, September, uh, as I recall, maybe October. Um, so, you know, it wouldn't have much impact on the election and probably won't anyway. I mean, the Chinese trolls could still operate on the platform whether China owns it or not. The Russian trolls are certainly operating on Facebook and Russia doesn't own Facebook. Um, so what's the real problem? I mean, you know, yes, there is a real problem with regard to security there, but I think the much larger problem is the algorithm. The example that I use in my article today is the fast food industry. Back in the 1940s and early 1950s, in the, in the years after World War II, processed foods became a thing. I mean, a real big thing. You know, I, I remember as a little kid, you know, five, six, seven years old, uh, when my, my parents bought some TV dinner trays and my dad used to go to the supermarket and buy these Swanson frozen dinners. And they were just, the, everybody thought they were just the coolest thing. You know, it's balanced meals. And but the reality was that it was ultra processed food. It was not good for you. Um, and, uh, but the bigger reality was that in the late 40s, early 50s, scientists in the food industry started using research in the addiction industry, uh, or you know, the addiction subset of the medical field, um, to figure out how to make food addictive. And what they learned was there was this thing called the deadly triad. And if you include these three ingredients in pretty much any food, but particularly processed food, it triggers three different levels of craving in your body that make that food addictive. And those three things are salt, sugar, and fat. Uh, we, we crave all of these things because, uh, you know, as, as a consequence of evolution, I mean, you know, the salt and uh, salt, of course, we need to maintain salinity levels for our body to properly function. And people who don't live on the seacoast and don't eat a lot of fish can be salt deficient and that can be problematic. Um, with sugar and fat, you know, we're, we're primed to store up fat to prepare ourselves for famines. And so that's why it's so easy to gain weight. You know, you overeat. Every time you overeat, you might gain, you know, a, a, a thousandth of an inch in weight. You don't really notice it. But if you do it every single day or over a long period of time, it adds up and suddenly, boom, you know, you're overweight. And uh, the food companies know this and, and they know that all they have to do to get you to overeat is to add salt, fat, and sugar to the food. So in the 1960s, when Lyndon Johnson was president, I believe it was 64, it's in my article, it's a hot link to the legislation. Um, he and the, and the Democrats in Congress got legislation passed requiring truth and labeling that uh, fast food and processed food manufacturers disclose how much fat, how much sugar, and how much salt is in their, is in their food products. Um, salt is also problematic for people with high blood pressure and who don't want to get hardened in the arteries, um, if, if my memory is correct, you know, from high school biology. So uh, what, when we apply this to social media, what we see is that social media also has a secret set of ingredients. Now, the food industry, starting in the 40s, the, F, you know, the FDA and, and the Congress tried to regulate this, and, and it took them 20 years. It wasn't until the 60s that there was any sort of meaningful reg re re regulation. And then, and then in the 70s, Nixon actually strengthened them more. And then in the 80s, Reagan strengthened them even more than that, these food disclosure requirements. Now, it wasn't actually Nixon and Reagan. It was the Food and Drug Administration. Um, but, you know, it was under during their administration. So you would think that this is kind of a bipartisan thing. But the bottom line was they were trying to protect us which is one of the jobs of, the, of, the, of a government, of any government. They were trying to protect us from a health crisis. 
Well, you know, we've got the health crisis anyway. The labels weren't enough. We needed really to go a little farther, but, but the labels were a good start. Disclosure, transparency. Well, social media has something very much like sugar, fat, and salt, like the deadly triad. And that is the algorithm that, you know, if you start Googling, uh, excuse me, if you go to YouTube and say, I want to see a, you know, a speech by Donald Trump, then, you know, the next thing it might recommend could be a Nazi video. Um, if you are on social media and you like a couple of Donald Trump things pretty soon, you know, within a month or so, they're going to be feeding you Nazi stuff and, and Proud Boy stuff and, and uh, wacky conspiracy stuff and anti-vax stuff. Um, you know, Facebook, Twitter, um, you know, and, and YouTube, uh, you know, are, are probably the worst at this. I mean, there's a bunch of other um, social media sites that I post to every single day and that I've signed up to, and I encourage you to as well, um, uh, you know, but, um, and they include, uh, I'm trying to find my list here. Uh, they include Blue Sky and, um, uh, in fact, I'd have to I'd have to pull it up, and I'll I'll get to that in just a second. But anyhow, there's there's a bunch of them out there um, that you know are alternatives to this. Huh. I apparently don't have uh, uh, apparently don't have that that paragraph in here. I don't know what happened with that. But anyhow, the uh, the bottom line is that um, these social media companies have this secret algorithm. And the secret algorithm, and, and frankly, I think that, you know, the one on Twitter, for example, since Elon Musk took over, has been recalibrated. I've, I follow some conservatives, and I've noticed that, you know, they're getting thousands, and in some cases, literally tens of thousands of new followers every month. We have been stuck at the same number, uh, roughly, for ever since Elon Musk took over. You know, our Twitter following was consistently growing, and then it kind of froze. Um, uh, a, a couple of years ago when Mark Zuckerberg had his private meeting in the White House with Donald Trump and Peter Thiel, uh, we noticed that, you know, over the following weeks, our, Twitter, our Facebook traffic just dropped about in half. I mean, it's probably 10% of what it used to be now. So I think the Facebook algorithm is also, you know, suppressing progressives, particularly high profile progressives. And, and promoting right-wingers. I mean, the whole January 6th thing, m much of it was organized on Facebook. In fact, an entire genocide in Myanmar, uh, you know, the, the Rohingya genocide, was organized on Facebook. So, and, and was driven in part by the algorithm. So, uh, I wrote a book about this, you know, The Hidden History of Big Brother in America. And in that book, and in my article today over at HartmanReport.com, um, I think that uh, there's a really simple solution to this. While I'm all in favor of ByteDance having to divest itself of TikTok, like I said, I'm skeptical that's going to happen. But more important, frankly, is that the algorithms become public, both the source code and a plain English explanation of them. Just like on a candy bar, you have the ingredients list and then you have a plain ling language box that says salt, sugar, you know, uh, fat, et cetera that, you know, it, it should be truth and labeling, frankly. And it shouldn't be all that complicated. So anyhow, I'm calling for that in my article and, and uh, I'm hopeful. I mean, and I'm hopeful that Congress will pick this up and, and go with it because uh, we really do deserve to know what's being pushed at us, by whom and why, and, and what's being suppressed for that matter. So this is my idea of uh, the, the best kind of legislation that we can have. We'll be right back.